Africa and the Caribbean share the significant impacts of climate change. We are seeing an increased rate of the warming of our planet, leading to desertification, drought, and water scarcity. At the same time, our low-lying urban regions from Cape Town to Georgetown and from Lagos to Castries face the impact of storm surge and sea level rise. Water scarcity in particular impacts extractive industries from tourism to mining. For example, we are seeing already the power challenges that Ghana is facing with Lake Volta and the downside effects on its energy. We are seeing the tension over the use of the Nile River for hydropower. We in the Caribbean have been deemed the region in the world most vulnerable to natural disasters, particularly due to the impacts of hurricanes and tropical storms. Just a few weeks ago, we, we were witness to Hurricane Beryl, the earliest known major hurricane ever, and the impact on the Eastern Caribbean on Grenada, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Barbados, Jamaica, and St. Lucia. These hurricanes can wipe out the equivalent of years of economic activity in just a day. The Caribbean has been leading the way to point out that we need climate justice. We pollute the least but suffer the most. We actively dis dis advocated under the 1.5 to stay alive campaign in Paris climate meetings in 2015. Countries in the Caribbean and in Africa are essentially being told to adapt and become more resilient to climate change. However, telling countries that are already struggling to overcome years of systemic poverty and exploitation that they must be resilient is like telling the fish it needs to start learning to walk on land. Without sufficient financial resources, adaptation is but a pipe dream. In many instances, what we are left with are climate refugees and climate migration. It is everyone's business to provide Africa with the resources it needs to set out on a climate resilient, sustainable pathway. Mr. Chairman, many countries in the Caribbean are known as SIDS, small island developing states. While countries in Africa may not be considered as small relative to the Caribbean, many are highly indebted and suffer from the twin effects of high indebtedness, unemployment, and as I mentioned earlier, the effects of climate change. In the Caribbean, we are in full alignment with the 1.5 degrees centigrade to be used as the basis for all discussions to and during COP29. However, our people are becoming increasingly restless and impatient as we fail to see the promises of climate financing for adaptation and mitigation. We continue to wait for the $100 billion promise made years ago to fund climate action. Our people were heartened when, at COP28, it was agreed that a loss and damage fund would be established and financed. However, as I speak, the fund has not received many of the promises. Mr. Chairman, while the science has proved that the more developed countries have been the greatest emitters and cause of climate change, we in the developing world continue to plead to the developed world and international financial institutions that traditional measures of economic performance cannot be used as an appropriate guide of our economic situation. We have largely called for vulnerability and climate factors to be used in our economic metrics. Last week, I'm told that the United Nations have accepted the use of the multi-vulnerability index as a factor in the measure of economic performance. We in the developing world call for quick, practical application of that index at the earliest. Mr. Chairman, we also believe that there should be a calculation of how much of our indebtedness as a region is due to climate action and the portion of our debt due to these factors in the first instance should be written off or forgiven. We also believe that in our loan agreements with international financial institutions, there should be disaster clauses that ensure that loan payments stop after disaster and not compounded as overdue or late payments. Mr. Chairman, 
we align ourselves fully with the objectives of the Bridgetown Initiative and call for its consideration and adaptation. Mr. Chairman, the future of our planet, our economy, and our people can be destroyed in an instant with a hurricane. Our food security is threatened by drought on one hand and on the other extreme flooding. We see the daily effects of drought in Africa and its costs in the form of human suffering, starvation, and forced migration. Mr. Chairman, we in CARICOM believe that COP29 should be a finance COP. We need to consider the special circumstances of SIDS are formed in the United Nations Framework on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement as a main priority for our CARICOM region and must be protected and operationalized throughout the climate change policy agenda and reflected in the decision establishing the new collective quantified goal on climate change. It is important that Africa and the Caribbean find common areas where we can build our resilience and face the developed world with a unified position to save our planet through climate action.